Welcome pilots, my name is Hybrid V, and tomorrow, or today if you're watching this on Friday, there is going to be a Q&A panel featuring the FPS teams and the flight team members that were at CitizenCon, and they're going to be answering some of your guys' questions regarding those elements of the game that were shown at CitizenCon, and it gives you an opportunity to kind of posit some questions and get some further clarification on those systems. There are two Spectrum posts regarding this, so if you're interested in actually checking out the questions that are there or posting your own questions, I will have links below for you to check those out. But for today, what we're going to do is we're going to check both for those threads, the FPS teams and the flight teams. We're going to check what are the current top questions right now that are being posed to those team members. And then hopefully, you know, by tomorrow when we see that stream go up, we'll get some answers. But let's just dive right in. Let's see these questions that folks are asking. All right, let's kick things off with the FPS panel. So the number one question as I'm recording this is currently by X Lord Helmet. And they ask, will there be counters to the pinging system? For example, equipment that would jam that pinging or suits that won't show a signature. Now, this is a pretty good question because we do know that CAG have said, yes, there will be ways of countering this. One of the most easiest, simplest way to do it is, of course, is like EMP technology, right? So if a ship or even an FPS equipment, because we know they're making like different types of grenades. They've talked about this in the past, and one of them is going to be type of like EMP grenade. There are going to be ways to kind of e-war counter another person who are using the this pinging system. So if you, for example, are getting yourself into combat, maybe you want to bring some EMP grenades with you with you and your squad because you don't want the other team to be able to ping where you're at. But not only that, guys, remember that the actual being picked up by the ping system entirely has to do with your emissions. And part of your emissions is how much noise you're actually making in the battle space. So if you're running around, you're wearing heavy armor, and you are just laden with tons of equipment on you, you're going to make a lot of noise as you're running around. And if someone pings, the ping system is going to pick you up. Not only that, but it's also going to be dependent on the type of suit that you're wearing. So for example, if you're wearing the Novikov armor, which is technically supposed to be powered armor, it doesn't really seem like it in the game right now currently, but it is supposed to be powered armor. Well, someone's going to probably pick you up because you're going to have quite a huge power spike compared to, say, wearing some light armor or just a flight suit. So there are going to be ways to counter it. I know there's been a lot of questions currently about people calling the ping system that was shown for Squadron 42 like wall hacks, but you have to remember that that is entirely based on the equipment that you're bringing with you to the battle space. So if you're bringing marine style armor with you, you're probably going to have a visor and an onboard system that's going to make it easier for you to actually do these pings. But if you're running around with, say, Grey Cat armor, which is more focused for mining, the ping system may be more suited for picking up minerals than it is actually picking up soldiers. That's the trade-off you're going to have to deal with, right? Maybe you want that extra carrying capacity because you want to mine additional gems. Well, you're going to probably lose out on, say, having a crosshair or even having that ping system for picking up soldiers. However, if you're running around with marine armor, you get less ability to carry extra equipment such as like gems and whatnot. But you are going to get the ability to ping and find enemy soldiers that are moving around the battle space. Now, of course, this does leave it a little bit more open ended, because then what if I just want to bring that gray cat armor so I can carry additional gems and whatnot, but I just bring a Clark defense helmet, which is the Marine helmet that gives me the ability to ping. Well, we'll see what the answer is to that at the q and I don't know if they're going to elaborate on that, but my guess would be that you need parts of the other suit for it to fully function to get the most out of the visor, but we'll see. Don't know. Again, this is all entirely speculation and not confirmed quite yet. I'm only going off what CAG have said in the past. And we will see if we get more details later down the line or maybe within this Q&A. All right, let's move on to the next question. Next, we have Caden asking, are different types of vision something you're working on, such as night vision, thermal, etc.? And the easiest answer is yes. We've already seen multiple times this question being asked to CAG as far back as 2016. This has been asked. And yes, it is a thing that they are going to work on. I'm just not certain what exactly that's going to be, or at least that's what CAG has said. They're not exactly certain how that's going to play out. And maybe they have it ready for Squadron 42. We don't know. They didn't show it for us at the Squadron 42 uh, showcases for CitizenCon. So yeah, I don't know. We'll see in this Q&A panel what they are going to be working on if they've already started work on this type of stuff or if it's already ready for Squadron 42. Now remember, this Q&A panel is just going to be a live stream. I doubt there's going to be any real show until I hope so, but rarely ever during star citizen live we ever see any real like actual gameplay or development footage it's almost entirely just a one-on-one -on -one with the developers so hopefully they will at least tell us 
where they're at with that. And hopefully the answer to that is that it is in a state where it's almost ready to be pushed out or it's been worked on. And hopefully it's not something that just got started on because that would be a little disappointing. I would also like to see that in Squadron 42 as well. Uh, but yeah, they've already said that that's going to be a thing they're going to be working on. Where it's at, I think it's going to be the biggest question most people are going to have on their minds going forward. All right, let's move on. Next, we have Phoenix asking, currently emptying the magazine in the weapon is coupled with a forced automatic reload, which prevents the use of a secondary weapon or pistol. Is part of the FPS weapon rework also removing the automatic reload of the weapon and rather allowing the player to choose when to reload the magazine, swap the weapon, or do neither and run away instead? Now, this is actually a great question because I absolutely detest auto reload in any game. Please give me control of my character. Do not take control away from my character by forcing me to reload. One of the things I like to do in any FPS game, if my primary runs out, then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to swap to my secondary, right? Because that's faster than reloading. So there's no real point in doing anything other than that. But of course, in Star Citizen, you always automatically reload once you're out. And even if you were going to hot swap to your pistol, Nine times out of ten network issues causes your character to do weird stuff with their animations where they'll drop the gun on the ground for a split second and then the pistol will come out and then it just starts to lag and does weird stuff. So hopefully they can dial that stuff in. Of course, everything is now going to be going from Squadron 42 to be slowly ported to the Persistent Universe. So they're going to have to work out the kinks and issues with that, including the network issues that we're inevitably going to see involved with that. So yeah, I do hope that the transitions between that are going to be a lot smoother and I do also hope that they will give us the option to not automatically reload because that is incredibly irritating so yeah can't wait to see their response on that one uh but let's see who's next on the chopping block now we have kappa toast asking can you go more in depth into what you have planned for armor and the different types such as combat specialists etc so yeah, this will probably backfeed into a lot of the stuff I mentioned earlier before where you're going to have different suits and visors that are going to be useful for different scenarios. And yeah, I as well would love to hear a lot more detail on that stuff. I want to know what we can possibly expect as our first iterations. We already saw what we expect for Squadron 42, but of course all that is technically supposed to be militarized stuff, stuff that we won't necessarily see that often in the actual Persistent Universe. So I'm wondering what we could expect to see, at least starting out, like what exactly am I going to see for a flight suit visor in comparison to, say, a Clark Defense Marine armor or even the Grey Cat armor, right? The Grey Cat visor, will that have something unique with it? Like, how long is this going to take us? Are we going to expect different types of stuff? Or are we only going to get kind of first iterations that are going to be popping in, like some of the stuff that's kind of analogous to the Squadron 42 stuff before we start to get more bespoke Grey Cat armor visors or whatever, right? These are things that I'm quite interested in, and I would love to hear what they are going to say about that as well. All right, next up we have John Bradley asking, could you tell us more about the FPS mechanics for Bounty Hunting version 2? Now, I think Bounty Hunting version 2 mostly has to do with identifying and trying to find your bounties. So stuff like NPC informants and stuff like that. Although they did, of course, show in Squadron 42 bindings as a thing that you can actually bind a knocked out character. So with version two, are we going to also receive that at some point as well? Hopefully, I mean, they've already shown that they are working on improving the actual bounty hunter pods for transporting prisoners. So there's a lot of questions there I have as well, too. But uh, is, to my understanding, version two is mostly supposed to be about finding your bounties rather than relying on God markers. It's going to be more about like using the NPC informant system. And uh, the comrades are also going to have a little bit more of an expansion as well, too, there. But it's not entirely going to be the god uh, markers like we're used to now. It's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit more having to be kind of a detective trying to find your mark wherever they are within the world. So that's going to be quite interesting. But I mean, if they have more information to provide on that, that should be uh, quite interesting to hear. But yeah, let's see if they talk about any of the binding stuff and if that's going to be coming in pretty soon as well, because it seems relatively simple and straightforward. But yeah, anything's up in the air. So we shall see. Next up, we have Caden once again asking FPS compass ships have one. Why can't that be something on the FPS HUD? Well, luckily for you, Caden, that's already been answered technically, because if you look at any of the Squadron 42 gameplay footage that we saw from CitizenCon at the top of the screen, we had a compass. So, yes, a compass is coming to FPS, whether it's coming to all types of equipment that is unknown. But hopefully these developers will be able to elaborate that for us 
in the Q&A panel. Next up, we had Don Phantom asking, are the wide variety of FPS gadgets still in the works, such as the breaching charges, EMP, gravity, radar scatter, and deployable decoy grenades, placeable shields, rappling wires, jump packs, gliding packs, etc. Now this stuff is what interests me as well, because we've only really seen in uh, previous ISC some of the stuff for opening doors, breaching doors, mostly for doors that are unpowered. So this is all Squadron 42 stuff, but yeah. Deployable shields, we saw that a long, long time ago, especially with the old previous Star Marine stuff in the past, and then we had not heard hide or hair of that ever since. Now, obviously, CIG does want to make stuff like this. They have said they want to make stuff like this, but we just don't know when we're going to eventually see this. Did they make it for Squadron 42? If they did, are we getting that ported over to the PU, or are they just going to start working on that now? We don't know because it depends on what Squadron 42 got and what we're going to get ported as a result. So hopefully we will find out more by this Q&A panel. Next up, we have Kappa Toast once again asking many, too many people are already calling the new radar and ping mechanics wall hacks. Can you tell all the upsides and downsides and possible ways to remain undetected so people would stop calling it that? Yes, <laughs> this is a lot of uh, people were asking this question in the Q&A thread there, there's a lot of people who kept saying, this seems like wall hacks, this seems like wall hacks, this seems like wall hacks. I've already elaborated, guys, it's not wall hacks. There's a lot of ways you're going to get around it, but also you have to play smart as well. Like I said, if you're wearing heavy armor and you run around in the verse currently right now, the heavy armor actually does make quite a decent amount of noise. And if you put more equipment on it, like grenades, ammo, and additional guns, it makes even more noise. Don't believe me? Try it now, right now. Go run around in a flight suit, listen to how you sound. Then go put on some heavy armor with no equipment on it and run around. Then put heavy armor with equipment attached to your character and listen to the difference in your in the way you sound. That all will translate to something that you emit in the universe. So if you decide to run around really fast and all over the place, you're going to show up on other players' uh, visual FPS radars. And then when someone decides to ping you, you may show up there as well. And like I said, your armor is going to play a role. If you're wearing the Novikov armor, which is powered armor, chances are you're going to be picked up not only on passive, but easily get picked up by ping. You'll notice in some of the actual Squadron 42 demo footage, especially the one where they were showing the star map stuff, you saw that the actual dev was pinging the enemy and the enemy sometimes didn't actually show up on the ping. And the reason why was because some of the NPCs were taking cover behind objects. They weren't moving and therefore the ping could not actually see them. This was actually a detail a lot of people overlooked and didn't notice it, but hey, I was there. I definitely noticed it. And just to prove it, here's the actual footage from Citizen Con. So watch these two soldiers that are going to pop up right in front of him. So you see he took down one and there's one hiding behind the crate. Now watch what happens when he pings. You see how the ping does not actually pick him up? That is because he is not moving and therefore his suit does not pick him up. So yes, guys, there are ways to counter this stuff. Next, we have Aztec asking clothing over flight suits. So yeah, this is definitely a thing that I also have been wondering about, though. CIG have said that it's mostly a reputation thing. So of course, if you're wearing your flight suits 24-7, <laughs> apparently that's going to affect your character's hygiene, which also is going to affect your character's ability to gain reputation or even lose reputation. Yeah, so sometimes uh, maybe some people will just look at you kind of weird because you're just walking in to a bar with a full suit of heavy armor and guns on your back rather than wearing clothes. So yeah, there's going to be some, I guess, some social gameplay surrounding that. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see if they elaborate on that uh, or not at the panel. And lastly, we have Wolfbrother84 asking, for radiation, we're getting a med pen variant, but will we see other medical animations besides pens or magic beams? Something like bandaging, taking pills, or even splinting. Yeah, this is a thing that, unfortunately, they chose to just go with the Beam Citizen route. I was, when Medical first came in, I was a little disappointed that we just got nothing but Beam Citizen. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it makes things easier for them to manage because Beams are just a simpler way of doing gameplay overall. You just walk up to a player, point your little med tool at them, and then boom, health goes up. It's a very simple tool, but yeah, I would love to see them go the extra mile. I mean, it's... <laughs> It's over half a billion dollar game. I would love to see them go the extra mile and add something really cool, like being able to bandage myself, right? If I take a shot and I'm bleeding, sure, I could probably use the pen, but I would love to also be able to use, say, a bandage to stop bleeding. Maybe the pen doesn't stop bleeding. Maybe the pen will only just restore HP, but if I'm bleeding, I actually need to stop the bleeding somehow, either using a tourniquet or some type of packing bandage, something. 
900 years in the future, maybe bandages are a bit primitive, but I mean, come on, we still want to ground it in some level of reality. We call this a tactile universe. There's so much detail put into this really tactile universe that we're living in, and yet we are relying solely on beams to do nearly everything. Again, 900 years in the future, I understand that, but still, I'd love some things to be grounded in reality if we can help it. So if they decide to expand medical further down the line to make it not as beamy, that would be phenomenal. I'm wondering what they're going to say about this. Though I'm not going to hold my breath. We did not see anything with that with the Squadron 42 demonstration. And if we didn't see it there, I doubt we're going to see it ever. I mean, that's just my opinion, but I don't really think they're going to put any more else detail into this. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. We shall see. But let's go ahead and shift gears towards the flight team, which is also going to be there as well at this panel. And the first question we have for the flight team is by Capitost asking, with the new atmospheric model, how long an average ship is expected to be able to hover in place before the thrusters overheat versus a ship with dedicated VTOL engines? Yeah, relatively straightforward. We are going to have weakened thrusters and thrusters are also going to generate a lot more heat with the new changes with master modes coming in after all that gets ported over from Squadron 42. Yeah, and that question is relatively straightforward. How long are we going to be able to hover before we start to see detrimental effects or even additional wear? My guess is probably going to be pretty harsh because they don't want ships to be hovering all the time. They want ships to be flying a little bit more like airplanes. So that way they can be a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more cinematic for players on the ground who are doing other things rather than the current system now where they kind of look like floating balloons in some cases. So yeah, definitely would love to see if they have any information to provide us on that front at some point. So we'll see for that panel. Next, we have Shadow Sky asking when armor is implemented, is there an intent for armor to prevent all damage below a certain threshold? Alpha damage reduction. Will it serve more like a percent reduction or something else? So what they're asking here is essentially is how is armor going to be more functional in the future? Is it going to be like a percent damage reduction? Are there going to be HP values? What, what exactly can we bite our teeth into here with the data that they are going to show us? Uh, I do know that the current damage reduction percentage model currently is going to be axed. That is not a thing they're going to be going forward with in the future. Um, the only thing I can say is from my own research in the past is that things are going to have different values. Different weapons are going to have different penetration properties and those values are going to butt heads and the values that come out is the damage that's going to come out. Now, the HP system that we are currently used to now for ships is going to eventually go away and ships are just going to have like literal tensile strength values. So as you start to shoot a Gladius's wings, that wing is going to start to fall apart on its own volition. It's not going to fall apart because an HP value hit something. It's literally going to fall apart because parts of the joints that were holding it together fell apart and all the systems that were attached to it are now falling apart and damaged or becoming destroyed. And this is why I'm very excited for Maelstrom and the upcoming damage features. They did not demonstrate a lot of Maelstrom, especially with the ship combat aspect, so I'm very curious as to where they are. My guess is it's in a very, very early state, to the point that they just did not have anything ready to show at CitizenCon because they still had more work to do on it. I'm hoping uh, next year coming in with that stuff, we will see a lot more of Maelstrom in action because it's really, really interesting, guys. It's something I really, really <laughs> am excited for. Combat in Star Citizen has been great, but it will be absolutely phenomenal with this damage model because the HP system is just, it always boils down to whoever does the most DPS. It never comes down to really cool freak incidents that happen or anything like that. It never comes down to the person who gets that really cool lucky one in a million shot or anything like that. It just really kind of just boils down to who has the best accuracy, which I mean, at the end of the day, that's how it should be, of course, but it's just a DPS race and whoever's health pool reaches zero first is the loser. And I would love to be able to do more fights where it's not always just about splashing the opponent. Sometimes you just do enough damage where the other person is just like, you know what? I'm out. All right, you beat me. I'm just going to go limp back home. And as they come in for landing, parts of the ship is literally just falling off because they just got absolutely trashed. That's my personal dream. We shall see soon. And hopefully we'll get more detail about this as well uh, from the panel. We'll see. Next up, Architect asks, will we see more co-pilot interactions that will assist the pilot? Undoubtedly, yes. But please, yes, give us more co-pilot interactions. I love being in the Constellation co-pilot, manning missiles, manning the power triangle. But I mean, that's really all you get. You don't get much else other than just being a glorified passenger 
I would love to see a lot more. Now, of course, with the new MFD interactions, I imagine they're going to be able to port over tons of other stuff that the co-pilot will be able to do. So this is getting me pretty darn excited. I would love to be able to handle radar aspects. I would love to be able to handle communications and call in for hangers and whatnot. I would love to also be able to hail players while in the cockpit or the co-pilot seat. I know you can kind of somewhat do that now with your Moby Glass, but I would love to do it within the cockpit as the co-pilot proper. I would also love to be able to manage the different weapon systems, maybe assign custom weapon groups or whatever, or even yet yeah, just simply give me the ability to ping targets or pin targets, I should say, because currently right now only the pilot can pin targets and the gunners can only see the pilot's pin targets. I would love to have the co-pilot be able to pin targets for other gunners rather than the pilot having to do that. That way the pilot can just focus on flying while the co-pilot can actually be the eyes and ears of the group doing radar assignments and kind of pinning different targets and giving target acquisition data to the gunners and stuff like that. That would be phenomenal. That is the dream, but we'll see. We'll see what they talk about at the panel. <laughs> I feel like it's a, I'm a broken record constantly saying that, but I mean, yeah, we, we have to see what they say. I'm just giving you guys my two cents here. All right, let's move on. Next, we have Othmian asking, what is the current backlog of ships needing to be converted to master modes? A couple? 30 plus? <laughs> Othmian, try all of them. Every single ship has to be converted to master modes, but yeah, undoubtedly, there's probably going to be a few that are going to be brought in. I don't know if they're going to do them all in one go. I'm assuming they might. They, they might have to. It'd be kind of weird if you, for one quarter, we only get like 30 ships in Star Citizen, and then we have to wait another quarter before another 30 are ported over. I imagine they're probably just going to do them in bulk. But yeah, every single ship, including, as they said before in the past, NPC ships too, both in Squadron 42 and in the Persistent Universe, any unique ships like that, that even players are not going to be flying they have to be tuned as well so they have quite an undertaking in front of them yeah i don't envy them but i mean it needs to be done and i cannot wait we'll see how long it's going to take though all right next we have victor car off asking is there a more detailed plan for specialized ships such as interceptors or interdictors when switching between nav mode and scm now to my understanding that is supposed to be a pretty big distinction i know there's like kind of been whinging about master modes currently right now but remember master modes currently only just has the gladius we don't actually see the dynamics of other ships in the game currently including other big multi-crew ships heavy fighters medium fighters and of course interceptors what we do know is that interceptors are going to be incredibly fast in a straight line probably yeah maybe when they go into nav mode they're also going to be quite fast maybe switching in and out of modes but ideally what they're going to be for is intercepting and just tracking down targets that are trying to flee or targets that are coming towards them or whatever and they just want to be the first ones to intercept them they're not going to be the greatest for 1v1 dogfighting but they are going to be very sticky ships they're going to be sticking on you if you're trying to run away a lot next rob godfrey asks will qeds block a ship from switching into nav mode now i don't have the information directly in front of me right now but i'm pretty sure they said that it will uh maybe it was i think maybe it was a spectrum post i could look it up but i'm too lazy <laughs> My assumption is, yeah, like there there really wouldn't be any reason why it wouldn't. You have to remember that quantum dampening is supposed to affect ships using quantum and nav mode is utilizing quantum to get those extra speeds. They're creating a smaller bubble than what we're used to to go do full on quantum travel. So theoretically, yeah, a QED is going to be able to stop you dead in your tracks if you're trying to enter nav mode. Now, I don't remember if they fully confirmed that I'm a hunt. I feel like I've said that somewhere or heard that somewhere. I could confirm it, but I'm too lazy. <laughs> I'm almost 100% certain it will. Um, if that question does get answered, um, that will be fantastic. So we'll see. Maybe they'll turn around and say no. I don't know. But that would be very, very strange if they decide not to do that. It just, it feels like a no-brainer. But I mean, yeah, who knows? Next, Karadep asks, what is the plan for larger ships that are built around the idea of getting out rather than fighting, such as the Mercury Star Runner? With the loss of the Quantum Drive, it seems like they rapidly become sitting ducks. Now, obviously, they're not like losing the quantum drive permanently. What they mean is that the ability to switch to nav mode and not being able to just immediately quantum out of the area does kind of leave them with a bit of a drawback, right? Because they may be stuck in a combat scenario where fighters are on top of them. Maybe someone's using even a quantum dampener. And if you're in a bigger ship that's designed to escape combat or even just do data running like a, I don't know, a Herald or in this case, the Star Runner, right? Well, how do you escape combat at that point? Well, of course, the idea is supposed to be speed, but if you're in a Mercury Star Runner, you should be using those turrets. If you don't have turret gunners, you're going to be dead in the water. 
So yeah, that's going to be one aspect of it. Now, when it comes to, say, like a Herald, the Herald is just blazing fast with probably the only thing that can catch it will be an Interceptor. So yeah, and if you come across an Interceptor and you're in some type of data running ship, you're probably going to be screwed because that is going to be the perfect job of the Interceptor is to stay on you and make sure that you don't go anywhere. And if you do go somewhere, it's going to try to find you. It will catch you because its job is to find you and get in touch with you about your ship's extended warranty. Next, Ripyanu1 asks, how much testing has been done on industrial haulers, miners, and other non-combat ships when it comes to master modes? That's an interesting question, right? Because master modes is mostly being balanced around combat, but what about non-combat vessels? What is CIG's approach to balancing non-combat vessels? Because ships are going to be able to go underway just like any other ship, right? But the thing is, is we have to talk about some combat with them, not necessarily because they're going to be fighting, but they need to also fight for their life as well. There's a lot of balance considerations with that. And my own question is like, yeah, what are they going to do for a lot of multi-crew ships? Master modes is like easy to kind of parse because we've really gotten only just the gladius. We can kind of understand what they're going with. But yeah, when it comes to huge fighters or not fighters, I should say huge multi-crew ships and whatnot, like what is the goal with that? What's what's the goal with industrial ships? Like what is the plan of attack there? So yeah, excellent question there. Next, Otto Gibbon asks ship weapons question. Will ammo for ships ever be decoupled from the weapon itself? Right now, the ammo is basically inside the gun, but will ammo storage that varies by ship archetype and carrying extra crates of shells aboard larger ships be a thing that we could expect to see? This is a phenomenal question because we used to, a long time ago, before 3.0, used to have the ability to kind of see like different hard points on the ship when you were altering it, but you could also see that ammo was a hard point for a lot of those older ships designs that we had. You used to be able to put the ship on and then you had to also attach the hard point for the ammo as well. I'm wondering if they'll ever bring that back as a thing that that's quite an interesting concept right there, right? Because, for example, the Redeemer only can carry a couple of SEU crates, which you might be able to use for supplies. But what if you use those extra little crates for additional bullets for your guns, right? I mean, it may not be a whole lot, but those extra could go a long way. Can we rearm them on the fly? Do we have to take them to a hangar? There's a lot of questions there that definitely need to be answered for sure. And finally, Steve CC asks, for ships with no dedicated VTOLs, and minimal control surfaces, what is the intention for their atmospheric flight experience, considering that MAV power is reduced in atmosphere? Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, I think Black Maze also asked a similar question. I'll pull that up right now. And uh, he asked the same similar idea, basically saying like the Eclipse is not really doesn't have any control surfaces. Other ships like, for example, the M50 don't have control surfaces currently. Uh, how effective will they be since they don't have VTOL? Um, the real simple answer to that one I do know is that those ships need a gold standard pass. So a ship like the M50 will absolutely have control surfaces. Eclipse will probably more than likely as well have control surfaces too. We just won't see those until gold standard, of course. So if you're worried that your ship is not going to be able to perform very well in atmosphere because you just don't see the control surfaces or whatever, be mindful that if you are flying in a much older ship, those ships do need a gold standard pass. And when they finally get that gold standard pass, they will more than likely have their control services dialed in at that point too, and they will be animated and ready to go. So fear not, if your ship doesn't look like it's going to behave very well in atmosphere because you just don't see control services on it, that may be a thing that's coming soon. So be mindful of that. All right, folks, that's it for me today. Hopefully you enjoyed my rundown of all the popular questions being asked for this panel coming out tomorrow at the time of my recording. Maybe it's today for you, depending on when you watch this. But yeah, be sure to check out that panel when it does inevitably show up. I will try to get the link from the Star Citizen YouTube channel when they upload it there. I'll get the VOD there and I'll put the link in the description. So if you do catch this video a little bit later and you want to kind of see the follow up, that link will be in the description of this video. Yeah, folks, let me know what you think of the questions that were asked here. Do you have your own personal questions or whatever you would like to ask them? Let me know in the comments below and let's have a chat. All right, folks, that's it for me today. I hope you found this video very entertaining, but also thought provoking in the terms of what you would like to ask the devs these kind of questions going forward. If you did indeed enjoy this video, please leave a like as it really does help out the channel. And of course, if you want to see more videos like this and much, much more down the line, subscribe. Until next time, fly safe and I'll see you all in the black.